Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Now, was there somebody out in the atrium checking energy before we came in here today? Did somebody, did you have to like give up your energy before you came in here? I'm sensing there's not much energy here during our worship. We need, come on, is this a good day or not? Is this, is this the day the Lord has made? All right, so I don't know, maybe we need to do a, real, a redo. Worship was good, but we, we didn't have a lot of energy going here today. Let's look to the Lord right now. Can we? Come on. Come on, we're here. We're grateful, amen? We're grateful for all that God has done. And so, Lord, today we're just looking to you. We do bless every family that has lost someone to war or those who fought God to protect our country. Lord, we bless them. This is a time to remember that. We understand there's things going on this weekend, activities and events and picnics and things that people want to do. But right now we're in the house of the Lord. And God, our focus is on you today, God. And we're looking to you. God, and we're expectant of you today, God. And Lord, we're ready to receive all that you have for us. And so we bless you today in your presence, God. We thank you there's a river here today, God. There's a river of life, God, and it's lifing us, Lord. It's changing us, God. It's enabling us, Lord, to rise above all the affairs that are coming against us, Lord. So we bless you today in your house. We are so grateful to be here, God. We just give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, bless the Lord. All right, with that, all right, now you got some energy. Come on, that's good. Let's do it. Let's go to Matthew 14. And in Matthew 14, this is this, well, let's read it and then then I'll get into it. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went unto them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand, caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Before you sit down, give someone a high five. Say, Jesus is the Lord. Is the Lord. Amen? <laughs> Jesus is Lord. He is Lord. He is the Son of God. And we're so glad. We're so glad you're here today. And then you can be seated in the Lord's presence. Hallelujah. Now, there's a lot of, this story is familiar to all of us, and there's, you know, there's a lot of aspects to the story, if you will. You know, there's a lot of things going on in this story. Um, But undoubtedly, in every Bible I've ever had, the heading for this is Jesus walks on the water, right? Jesus walks on the water. It's all about Jesus walking on the water. That's really what everybody focuses on here. And, you know, that's always troubled me. Well, first of all, I'm not really fond of water to begin with, okay? I mean, I drink it, of course. I drink drink it. I've been known to shower in it occasionally. But... um, (laughs) Peg will tell you, like, we've had, we've had, when the kids were little, we got pool, we had pools in our backyard, you know, and I almost never went in the pool. The kids would have to drag me in there. Maybe on a really, really hot day, um, they would get me to go in there. But basically, I'm, like, I'm not a, I'm not a beach type guy. I'm a landlubber, basically, you know, and um, I think it might have something to do by the time my wife talked me into going whitewater rafting. Yeah, do we have any other fools in this place that have tried that? I think it's, the, I think it's actually the definition of insanity to go whitewater rafting. We went whitewater rafting on the Black River. So apparently the Black River has white water. And um, we went there, and I, before we even got there, I already knew I did not like the Black River. You know what I'm saying? Like, what good can come out of a Black River? And so we get there, and um, they tell us that the water is too low to go rafting. So inwardly, I'm like, thank you, Jesus. This is awesome. And outwardly, it's like Peg was so looking for it. It's like, oh, Peg, we can't go rafting. 
Uh, well, then the guy says, well, don't worry, don't worry, because within, a few, within about an hour, the, because there was a power plant somewhere up there controlling the water flow, and he says, and within an hour, you'll be rafting. <laughs> yeah, so we did go rafting. And if your idea of fun is capsizing and almost drowning, <laughs> it's a great time. It really is. We did end up in the water, okay? If it was not for some heroics on my part to get us through that, no, we... That's another story. But we, we had a pregnant lady in our, in our raft. We had two guys that were high on something in our raft. And there we are. We're in the water. We ended up in the water. So, good times. Yeah, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again. I promised Peggy on our 100th anniversary, we're doing it again. Black River, here we come. So... In our, in our text today, Peter, Peter and the boys, they, they got to come their, their own whitewater rafting experience here that, that's taken place for them. And so I want to go through this, and I want to look at it. You know, we all know about Jesus walking on the water and stuff, but I want to look at it a little differently today. I just want to help you to see the, the, the essence of it. It's, from, it's really very simple, and this is the essence of, of the gospel and, and God's desire towards your life, okay? So as we go through this, let's go back to verse 22 again. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat, And go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. So the story starts out with Jesus sending the disciples out without him. Everyone say without him. him. He sent them out without him. So he was going to stay back. He says he dismissed the crowd and then he he begins to pray. He's going to spend some time in prayer. Um, But his directions were rather explicit, weren't they? He, um, he sent them away, okay, and the, the, the idea was, okay, he said that where he was sending them was to the other side, right? He was going to send them to the other side of the lake. Now, there were obviously, there were towns on the other side of Galilee. This is the Sea of Galilee. There's, there's towns on the other side of Galilee that he wanted to go into Galilee for a reason. He wanted to go there. There's people he wanted to visit, things he wanted to do, okay, places he wanted to be. Um, you know, made known in. But I'm looking at this less, less of a geographical location, and to me it's more of a, a place in God. He's sending them to the other side. Now, we know Israel's history, right? And in Israel's history, this played a part because, remember, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, and as they were leaving, they had to cross over a big body of water. Remember that? It was the Red Sea. And how did they get across it? It it just parted for them, right? It was supernatural. It was miraculous. And so then the children of Israel are spending time wandering in the the wilderness, and God wants to get them into the promised land, and there's another body of water in the way. Remember what that was? The Jordan River. And they had to, so they had to cross, so in both instances, they had to cross over. They had to get to the other side. There's something on the other side that God has for us. So when we're talking about the disciples going to their side, Jesus specifically told them they're going to the other side because there's another side for us when we're, we're talking about spiritually. A part, of your, a part of your spiritual maturity, maybe we can put it that way, is, is this idea of crossing over to something else. Okay, um, so there's numerous other sides involved. See, because this side, let's, let's look at it this side. This side, now right before this, Jesus had fed the multitude, so the, a miracle had just taken place. But on this side, because he sent them to the other side, on this side is where we're kind of comfortable. On this side is where uh, we're familiar. Okay, to us, on this side, this is where it's at. I mean, this is where I'm at right now. This is where it's at for me. It's on this side. I like where I'm at right now. I'm on this side, okay? So through this whole thing, you see, we have to realize God, God wants to take us to new places, to different places. Now, we're not talking physically, again, not geographically, but we're talking about there's experiences in God. How many of you know we've not experienced everything God has for us? Isn't that right? How many of you have seen the dead race to life? Now, it's in my Bible. I've read about it. I've talked to people who have actually been involved in those type of things. But we're talking about there's, there's all kinds of things that God wants to yet do. Sometimes we get this idea that we've seen it all, done it all, you know, been there, done that. No, no. There's so many more things that God has for us. 
And wh- where is that? On the other side. There's a new side. There's something different, something, something challenging, something more that God has for us. Okay, so the other side simply represents where you're not at right now. So if you've never spoken in tongues, been filled with the Holy Spirit, the other side could be that. If you've never, you know, see, laid your hands on the sick and seen them recover, the other side could be that. The other side is whatever you've not yet experienced in God, whatever you've not yet fully embraced, God doing, you know, miraculous things, supernatural things. That's the other side. And so that's where Jesus sent them. He sent them to the other side. And so our mission is going to be part of your mission, part of your um, destiny is going to be going to new places and doing new things in God, experiences in God. Okay? Amen. Boldly going where no man has gone before for the Trekkies. Okay, so we're on a journey. We're on a journey. And until we meet him face to face, be that he returns or I pass and, and I go into his presence, until I meet him face to face, I've not yet arrived. I've not yet arrived. I've been at this pastoring thing for 37 years, and I'm still learning. God is still calling me to go to the other side. I was just at a conference in Elam this week, and learning, not just learning in the meetings, but hanging out with guys, hanging out with people that have more than I've got, that have experiences I've never had, that have visions that are beyond my... See, you, there's more to have yeah. in God, and, and we're constantly pressing. Disciples means a learner. So I'm a, I'm a disciple. I'm a learner. I'm still learning. You never stop learning. You never stop growing. When you get comfortable where you're at, that's when everything begins to cease, okay? So we're going to the other side. Now, what was interesting about this, and I wish I could really get into this a little bit, but I love the fact that Jesus sent the disciples. So the disciples go out together, right? They're going to be in the boat together. And Jesus stays back all alone. And it's such a powerful thing to to see how often Jesus sought solitude. He loved to be alone because when he was alone, He was never really alone. He loved to be alone with the Father. And he loved solitude. And yet, many of us find it so difficult to be alone. Many of us, you know, we detest solitude. We don't want it. If if I'm in the car by myself, I've got the radio blasting. Right? I've got to have something. I've got to have noise. I've got to have someone talk to me. I've got to have, I can't be alone. And there's something in that. Like I said, I really wish we could develop that whole thought. But because something came to me this morning about that. And I'll just, I'll just save it for another time. But Jesus wanted to be alone. He sent the disciples out. And he himself was going to stay back and be alone with the Father. Okay, verse 24. And the boat was already a considerable distance from the land. Okay, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. And in the fourth watch of the night... Jesus went unto them walking on the lake. Okay, so verse 23 tells us, going back to verse 23, it said that Jesus sent them out and it was evening. Now evening in Israel, it always started at 6 p.m. So this is roughly 6 p.m., give or take, okay, the evening. They don't see Jesus again until one, one version says it's almost dawn, okay? The King James says the fourth watch of the night. So Jesus sent them out at night. What time was it? About 6 o'clock. He comes to them at the fourth watch, almost dawn. That would, the fourth watch would be between 3 and 6 a.m. Now you do the math. They haven't seen Jesus for at least 10, possibly 12 hours. They're out in the middle of the lake by themselves with a storm. Why would Jesus send them out into a lake with a storm brewing? No, I'm asking you. Someone tell me. I hope, I hope you got an answer to that. Why does he send them out? He sends them out. And for 10 hours and for hour after hour, he's not there. He sends them out. So why, why, is, why is he doing this? Why is he, you know, why is he sending them out? Why did the chicken cross the road? <laughs> same, same reason the disciples, right? They get to the other side. Chicken's getting the other side. They got to go the other side. Now listen, you got to go the other side. There's more things that God has for you. Does not mean it's always easy. Doesn't mean it's always smooth. Doesn't mean there won't be no turbulence. Doesn't mean there won't be some resistance. 
Sometimes if there's any kind of, you know, difficulties at all, we just want to chuck it in and say, okay, then God can't be in this or this can't be God. Jesus sent them out. Everyone say Jesus sent them out. Jesus sent them out. He sent them out. And then he doesn't show up for a while because there is a, there is a season here, a testing, if you will. Okay, so your destiny, your destiny, getting to your destiny, the things that God still has for Jim Crowley, the things that God still has for you, okay, there are going to be obstacles to those things. That's a given. There's going to be wind, there's going to be waves, there's going to be storms. They're going to come against us. And for some of us, okay, that's a big problem. But remember, what did Jesus tell them? He told them that they were going to go to, what did he tell them? Did Jesus say, I'm sending you guys out in the middle of the lake and there's a chance you're all going to drown? I don't know. You know what I mean? There's a chance you guys aren't going to make it. I wish you the best. What did he say? When God tells you you're going to the other side, guess where you're going? You're the other side. It doesn't matter what rises up against you. So God is giving you promises. God is giving you his word. That is going to come to pass. No matter what you're facing right now, you may be in that time and say, well, I don't see it happening, okay? He sent me, I'm out here, but he's back there somewhere. All right, now God is always with us. But the point being, you're feeling alone. You're feeling that I'm out here. You're feeling all these things coming against me, and I thought I was doing the will of God, and yet why haven't I seen it happen yet? Well, if God told you you're going the other side, you're going the other side. And all the power of hell can't stop it. No storm is going to make a difference. We don't like storms, okay? We prefer not to have storms. If you can get through life without white water rafting, I suggest you do it. <laughs> However, if you get stuck in there, then God is with you. Yeah. Yeah. Even on the Black River, he shows up. He's there. <laughs> so nothing's going to stop me from my destiny. Amen. I said nothing's going to stop me from my destiny. How about you? So Jesus now, okay, so Jesus is going to come to them, right? It's time for him to come to them. Um, On the fourth watch of the night, he comes to them walking on the water. I wonder why, 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 couldn't Jesus have gotten a boat from somebody? He was used to borrowing things from people, right? He borrowed Peter, he took things that didn't take him, steal him. He borrowed things, he let people help him. Why why couldn't he have gotten in a boat? Um, what's this all about? Why does he have to come walking on the water? Is he showing off here? Is this Jesus trying to be dramatic? Here I come, you know, and does, is this, what's this about? It didn't really have to happen this way, did it? Jesus, okay, I want you to see this. So in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them. Can I, can I just, okay, we, we just sang about miracles. God is a God of miracles. That's who he is. He does miracles. We, we see miracles. We know miracles. We believe in miracles. The supernatural, the power of God. There's no, there's no question about that. Okay, there's no question about that. But this is not really about that. I think more than anything, this, this is Jesus, as he often did, taking advantage of situations to make a statement, to make, in this case, a, a prophetic statement. He went unto them. All right? So the whole thing, the whole thing really revolves about, around the fact that Jesus wants to be where they were. He was out to get them. He wanted to be where they were. And walking on the water was just the quickest way or the simplest way for him to do that. So he wants to be where they are and nothing's going to stop him. Nothing's going to stop him. So at this time, okay, the waves, the wind, you know, the water itself, everything there that is, that is happening with these disciples, they're in the boat by themselves, and they don't know the end of the story like we do, and they don't have the confidence they're going to get through to the other side. They're in a boat, and things are not going so well. I've been there. I've been in a raft. Things are not going so well. And um, that, these are the things they feared, They're fearing the water. They're fearing the wind. They're fearing the waves. And so essentially, Jesus comes walking on the things that they're afraid of. He's letting them know that the things that bother you, the things that that hinder you, okay, the things that that can kind of set you back, Jesus wants them to know, 
I've already conquered those things. He wanted to show them the enemies under his feet. Is there something today in your life that you fear? It's already under Jesus' feet. Is there something you think can keep you from God? Or maybe keep God from you? Yeah, I've got the sin, I've got the struggle, I've got this thing, this thing happening, this addiction, this... He's already conquered it. You know where it is? It's under his feet. Whatever you fear can hold you back from going forward in God, whatever you fear can keep you from the other side, the more, the better, the new, the different that God has for you, has already been conquered. And it's under Jesus' feet. It's firmly under the feet of Jesus. All things are under the feet of Jesus. And so, we have nothing to fear. You may have fears, and fears, fears, I realize, can be powerful. Was there, was there a reason for the disciples to fear the water? Yeah. In a very natural sense, of course. Yeah. Waves, wind, things coming against you. Was, it, was there a reason for me to fear being thrown into the Black River? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> All right? With my lovely wife and pregnant ladies and everybody else that was in there with us. Um, but, but the reality is, see, as, as you step out, okay, we're talking about going to the other side, so that takes faith. And the Bible says... Faith is our victory, First John 4. Faith is our victory. So as we put our faith in God, faith, faith is your confidence in God. And so as you go to the other side, as you step out into the unknown, because that's what it is, and that's where some of us fear, whatever's unknown, we don't know what's coming, we don't know, you know what's awaiting us, so hey, there can be a fear there, all right? Jesus is not just with you, but Jesus is stomping on whatever it is you fear. He's walking all over the thing you fear. Right? And so Romans 16, the God of peace will bruise Satan under your feet shortly. So what is under Jesus' feet is also under your feet because you are the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. And so if it's under his feet, it's under our feet as well. All right, so verse 27. So Jesus gets right to the heart of it then. But immediately he says to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. So take courage, don't be afraid. So that is the heart of God towards us. That's what the Lord told Joshua over and over again. Anybody that's going to serve God and, 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 and venture out into things, if you're determined to fulfill your destiny, okay, if you're going to serve God, if you're going to the other side, you're going to need to take courage and not be afraid. Now, how can we do that? How can we not be afraid when there's so many things to fear? People fear the economy, you know, and they fear world, you know, world events and politics and circumstances and rulers and all that, okay? When you know, when you know that Jesus is with you and that Jesus has all things under his feet, you can take courage and fear nothing. And when I was young, I was given to much fear. I, I had all kinds of fears in my life. Um, I was afraid of the dark. I was, afraid, I, was afraid, I was afraid of a lot of things. And I got delivered of that after I went into the ministry. And I've shared a little bit of that story before. But... Okay, but even though I've been prone to fears all my life, and um, I remember I was, I was afraid of hospital. My dad died in the hospital. I was afraid. The, so the first child we had, guess what? Guess who fainted during the childbirth? <laughs> Peg, how could you do that? How could you faint? You're supposed to stay awake. You should have stayed awake the whole time. Okay, our, our child's born. I go out into the hallway, and I'm, I'm seeing stars, and everything is dark, and I'm just, I found the wall, and I slid down the wall, and someone, I think it was a nurse, someone came, some nice person came up to me and said, can I help you, sir? I said, no, I'm having a baby. Just had a baby. This is the way you do it when you have a baby. So I've had all these fears in my life, but every, but constantly, listen, constantly, I don't, I don't have those, I'm not prone to fears like that, but the point being, I've, I've had those issues. And every, every time, not every day necessarily, but I pray constantly and I say, I fear nothing. I just tell the devil, I fear nothing. God is with me. If God before me, what can be against me? You know what I fear? Nothing. Nothing. 
Nothing. Yeah, but what if this thing goes wrong? What's it? So what? <laughs> we let it go wrong. God is with me. How does that change anything? I'm still a conqueror. I'm still a conqueror. And so when we know that, okay, so Jesus said, take courage. Don't be afraid. Life is full of wind. Life is full of waves, okay? Life is going to be full of storms and, and issues, okay? And if our focus is that, if your focus is on those things, you've got fear today. You are afraid. I can't control the future. I can't control the economy. I can't tro- control what's going to happen in my work. I can't, right. And so that can make you afraid, okay? But when our focus is on the one who loves us unconditionally, Amen. you're unshakable. Right. You're a part of an unshakable kingdom. That's happening to everybody else around me. It doesn't have to happen to me. I'm not in the world. I'm in Christ. And that changes everything. Okay, verse 28. So, if it's you, Peter said, Lord, then, then tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said, and Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and went towards Jesus. Okay, so, we know this is happening in a lake. We know this is happening in, in, a, in a turbulent situation. Can we just set that aside? Because that's everybody's focus. That's what everybody, he's walking on. Okay, can we just set this aside in a nutshell? In a nutshell. This is Peter. This is Peter. Saying, Lord, I want to be with you and I want to do what you do. That's his heart. It could have been in someone's living room. It could have been in someone's backyard. Lord, I I want to come to you and I want to do what you're doing. And Jesus said, come on. That's my heart too. That's exactly what I want. Come on out, Peter. Come with me. Because I came to be with you. Remember, he went unto them. That was the whole purpose of the story. He went unto them. So the water, the waves, all that other stuff is immaterial. He went to them. If there was a mountain in the way, he'd be mountain climbing. Okay? Whatever was in the way, he was getting to them. Now Peter says, Lord, I can't wait till you get in the boat. I'm coming to you. And he said, come. Because he wants you to be with him where he is and doing what he's doing. And so the heart, see, the heart of everything, the, the gospel message The gospel message, yes, there's power and there's miracles and there's all these things, but the heart of the gospel message is the deep, heartfelt longing that's in your Father's heart in heaven to have a relationship with you. That's what he wants. And so we think we got to do things and accomplish things, you know, and, and, and you know, there's so many rules and, and things I got to adhere to and I got to live up to standards. Okay, that stuff is so, so far from the, reality all he wants is a relationship with you a personal intimate relationship with you he wants to we've been called into the inner into the inner court so when you understand the tabernacle of moses remember there were three compartments and it was the outer court. So that's the outer court is symbolic. That's where the, the, the uh, bronze altar was there. So that's where Jesus um, delivers us from sin, delivers us from bondages. That's the outer court. And then after that, you come to the inner court. That's where Jesus restores our soul and makes us whole. Okay, so it's great to be delivered. We're saved, delivered from, from sin. Okay, brought into the inner court. We're now, but what's that all about? To go into the third, to go into the third compartment, to the Holy of Holies, where we're one with God. So your salvation is just so you can be one with God. Being restored is so you can be one with God. It's not about those things. It's about this. It's about being one with God and having a relationship with him. And so he saved you and cleaned you up and did things in your life. Why? So you could come to him unencumbered. You could come to him. And you can enjoy him and he can enjoy you. See, the essence of relationship is companionship. It's intimacy. It's delight. It's, it's joint decision-making. It is shared dominion. In other words, all these things are how God wants it to be. His heart delights in you. Does your heart delight in him? Do you just want to be with him? It's coming to church so we can be with him. I can be with him at home, but there's a special being with him when I come here. David succeeded where so many other people failed, not because he was smarter than anybody else, not even more gifted, but he knew something nobody else didn't know. What did he know? The Lord is my shepherd. He's my, I don't know if he's yours, but he's mine. He is my shepherd. In other words, David had a relationship with God. He didn't have a business arrangement with God. It wasn't a religious duty he had with God. God is my shepherd. 
He tends to me. I respond to him. We love one another. We got a relationship. And so while everybody else backed down in fear, the guy who had a relationship with God said, let me at him. Bring that big fat guy out there, okay, that says he's, he can beat it. Bring him on. I'm not afraid. I got God with me. Amen. When you got God with you and you know it, you're not afraid. And I believe it was Goliath that propelled David into greatness. See, difficulties try, you know, difficulties, the, uh, the Goliaths of your life, the storms, the waves, the wind, okay, all the things that come, you know why they're there? To promote you to greater things. Nobody knew David until he defeated Goliath. So God allows storms to come into our life because he's got greater things for us. And so it's personal relationship with God, okay? Jesus came to restore it. He said it in a bunch of different ways. Let me just, we're going to take communion in just a minute. In John 15, Jesus said this way. He said, I'm the vine and you are the... If we stay connected, hmm, you'll be very fruitful. But apart from me, if we stay connected, he didn't say if you memorize the whole Bible. All right? He didn't say if you speak in tongues for 10 hours a day. He didn't say if you witnessed everything that moves. Those are all good things. We're not, but what is it all about? Staying, can have a relationship with me. If you stay in relationship with me, you'll be very fruitful. Why? He's the vine. Yeah. You're not the vine. And all religious activity is not the vine. All, even the disciplines, spiritual disciplines, not the vine. He's the vine. And we are all our branches. branches. So each branch is different. Don't compare yourself to me, and I'm not comparing myself to you. You have a relationship with God. I have a relationship with God. You are unique in all of creation as God has so decreed it to be. You're created by God for God. You don't have to be like anybody else. You don't have to try to do what other people are doing. You are fashioned by your Father to be a distinct individual. You have strengths, you have weaknesses like all of us. But your relationship with the Lord and how he works in your life is one of a kind. I said it's one of a kind. How God works with you and how he works with me we might be totally different. How I relate to one child, another child. There's, there's things that override them all, of course. You know, there's certain, there's certain things, principles, if you will, maybe. But I love all my kids, but I relate to them all on a different level, in a different way, according to who they are and how they respond to me. All right? So it's not a contest. It's not like uh, trying to measure up. It's not an audition. It's not like I got to, you know, I got to try to see if I can make the cut here. You're in the family. God loves you. And I've said this before, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came so dead people could live. You were dead, now you're alive. And the work of sanctification, the work of God renewing me is all about him and me, not about you. You have no part in it. Stay out of it. Stay out of my business. I'll stay out of yours. How's that? Let God work in me. I let God work in you. And your whole relationship with God. So we sing a lot about the glory of God, the goodness of God. That, you know, your relationship with God really is going to be defined by how good you think God is. That's why we sing that all the time. Because if to you God is overbearing and God's demanding and God is insatiable, and God, nobody wants to cozy up to that. When you see you've got a Father in heaven who loves you, who paid the ultimate price so you could belong to him, who wants nothing more for you than you to be sitting in his lap, you run to him. That's what he wants. So this whole story, this whole story is not about water. It's not about miracles. That's in there. Like I said, there's so many aspects of the story that are powerful. But the heart of the story, I want to be with them. And Peter said, I want to be with you. And Jesus said, let's do that. Let's do that. What you believe about God's goodness defines your relationship. And when you know he's good, there's no problem with getting close to him. 
and enjoying what Jesus came to give us, a relationship with our Father in heaven. Amen? Amen. All right, we're going to take communion together now. So we could have the ushers. They're going to come forward, pass it out, if you guys would just help us right now. And hang on to the elements. And um, as we're doing this, as we're doing this, church, listen, many times we, 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 know, the, we know the drill now. Okay, but many times in many places in different churches, maybe your upbringing was the communion. You look at yourself, you examine yourself, okay, and we've, we've explained those scriptures and how that works. Paul, Paul said this, that in me, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. So all you do is look at yourself, you'll see no good thing. You'll see your failures and your sins and your, your weaknesses, and okay, and you'll say, I, I can't even draw close to you. I can't even do it. See, you don't look. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, not of you, not of your sin. Do this in remembrance of me. It's all about Jesus. And so today, while we're getting ready to take communion, it's all about Jesus. His awesome love for you and what he did for you. His body that was broken so you could be made whole. His blood that was shed so you could be forgiven. It's all about him. Your part is to simply receive it. So under the old covenant, if you had sin, you went, in, you went to the high priest or you went into the... Uh, the tabernacle, and you brought your you brought your offering, you brought your sheep, okay, your lamb, and you are a sinner. Of course, you knew that, but the priest didn't care about your sin. He didn't care about that. You'd confess him over them, but all he cared about was the lamb. He was examining the lamb, and as long as you brought an acceptable lamb, you'd be forgiven. Well, we have an acceptable lamb. His name is Jesus. In other words, the priest is not looking at the lamb or at the sinner. He's looking at the lamb. The father is not looking at you today. He's looking at his son. His son paid the price. You're totally forgiven. And so we're not dwelling on what we've done wrong and our sins and our faults. Okay, God, God knows those, of course, but he overlooks them. He's forgiven you. Your sin is not a problem with God anymore. It was paid for at the cross. He did that because he wants a relationship with you. It's all about relationship. And so today in communion, let's draw close to him, shall we? In your heart of hearts, we're just drawing close to him. It's all about Jesus, not religion, not church. It's Jesus. We preach Christ and him crucified. And that's what we're celebrating today in communion. We're celebrating his unconditional, unending love for you. And it can't be changed. There's nothing, there's nothing that could stop. What can separate us from the love of God? Romans 8. Can tribulations and trials and persecutions and peril and sword? No, nothing, nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And so in our heart of hearts, we're just cozying up to him. We're enjoying him. We're allowing him to have first place. Hallelujah. All right, bless the Lord. So this is, this is the body of Christ. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks. He broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, this is my body, which has been broken for you. Broken. Broken. He was broken so you could be whole. And so in wholeness, we're taking this. In wholeness, we're declaring our confidence is in God, not in ourself. Not, Christianity is about self-help. It's total dependence on the Lord our God. Faithful is he who called us who also will do it. And so we take this now, Lord Jesus, in remembrance of you. Let's take it together.
So the cup we hold, according to our Lord and Savior, is the cup of the new covenant. It's a cup that means you have been forgiven. Not will be, could be, might be, someday. You were forgiven at the cross. All your sins, past, present, future, were forgiven. Sin can never be a problem between you and God again. It'll be a problem on a horizontal plane in this world and with people. And you can ruin your body, you can ruin your marriage, you can ruin your health, you can ruin your relationships, your career, and on and on. But God has forgiven you. And this is the proof of it. So we hold this cup, this cup of the new covenant that signifies we've been washed clean. Our sins have been put away from us as far as the east is from the west. And so now we take this, Lord, in remembrance of you. Let's drink it together. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Can we all stand together, please? I want to, we're going to sing a song. And during this song, I want you to just worship the Lord from your heart, if you will. And I want you to look at what could possibly be your storm. In other words, what is it? that you might be afraid of in life? What is it that sometimes gets the best of you? You fear it? Because we're going to declare today God's victory over that thing. And so let's worship the Lord right now. Let's honor the Lord. Come on, sing it out. We're declaring it. How precious. Yes, thank you, Lord. There's no other way. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We're white today. We're forgiven. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can we have the altar workers come on up right now? If you've got a fear in your life, if there's something that you struggle with in regards to fear. I want you to come up. We're going to sing this again. We want to pray for you, okay? We want to minister to you. If I feel very strongly today, there's somebody here that's struggling heavily with depression. Maybe it's ongoing. Maybe it just came upon you. I don't know. But if that's you today, the Lord wants to set you free. Fears, depression, any type of 
oppression at all in your heart, don't, don't hesitate. Don't be afraid. Let's sing this again unto the Lord. And if that's you, come on up. If you need healing in your body today, come on up. If you need a miracle, come on up. You're going to get your miracle like Peter got his because you have a relationship with God and God loves you. Let's sing it again. Come on, he's our peace today. He's our peace. This is all my righteousness. He's our righteousness. But the blood of Jesus. Let's sing that again. Yes, this is all my hope. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We're receiving it, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So, Father, we thank you today. We thank you for the love that you've bestowed on us through Christ, that we should be called sons of God. There's an open heaven. We have free access to our dad 24-7. You love us, you're with us, you're for us. And let us never forget, Lord, it's all about relationship. Not do's and don'ts, not rules not following a prescribed set of duties. But Lord, it's all about just relating to you in our feeble way and you showing us how much you love us. May every eye here be open to your goodness and in your goodness we can draw close. Thank you that we're welcome in the throne room, Lord. Thank you for all you're doing in our lives. This is a day of deliverance. This is a day of freedom, God, not only for the people responding, but everybody here today. Your hands upon them for good. We're going to leave here today in the power of the Holy Spirit. We love you and bless you in Jesus' name. I want to thank you for coming today. I love you. The Lord loves you. Have a great day. If you do need prayer, don't hesitate. Come on up. We'll still minister to you. God bless you. Lord be with you.